します。Beach, home of Neurosurgical TV. There's no sun in Prague. Yeah, so yeah. <laughs> uh, you want to go first? And uh, I'd like to introduce Vlad, Vlad Bennett and let him take it away. Okay, Vlad, welcome. Yeah, okay. Welcome, so hello. First, okay? All right, so let's go okay. for the share screen. Okay. Uh, uh. This one. All right. Is it okay, John? Perfect, perfect. Perfect, thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's uh, it's a pleasure to be here on Neurosurgical TV, and I believe that uh, John Bennett and uh, Ayb Cherian are doing excellent work by spreading the knowledge. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about the inner approach. I will later on explain what this term means. Uh, there is the option is Ritrosic, which is a very popular and uh, like a working horse. But in my hands, Ritrosic approach is for eight nerve schwannoma only. And some few exceptions, let's see, like this small cavernoma of the eight nerve, it was really done by Ritrosic approach because no other approach would be fine. The same thing, this is after, the same thing is this cavernoma, which developed nicely. Uh, you will enjoy the dynamics of the disease. This is 2013, the patient came in and he only has this uh, venous anomaly. So we did, of course, nothing. Then the patient bled from cavernoma, which should be hidden somewhere in the hematoma. We evacuated the hematoma, this is after. And then this year, a few weeks ago, he came again. It's a fully grown hematoma with the bleeding. It looked like that. And uh, what's important that the lesion is above the seven and eight it means that it will be difficult to reach by uh, any other approach but uh, retrosic so uh, i will show you this uh, cavernoma because there is uh, something which uh, i would like to share with you see the veins which are above and below the cavernoma these veins should and must be preserved at all costs any damage to any of these veins most likely would end up fatally. There is another one which is hidden below the superior vein, and this is the scar tissue in the brain stem, which really was hiding the cavernoma. You see the seventh eighth over here. You see the nerves, you see the little perforators, which also should be preserved. And the cavernoma is here above the nerves. After the surgery, patient did a temporary seventh nerve pathway, which uh, improved within several weeks, which was uh, not really a problem. This is at the end of the surgery, and this is pure retrosic approach, and I don't think that some other approach would be suitable for such a lesion. But majority of lesions are not in this region, not in the CT angle at this point. So what we have now available, the oldest approach is lateral, which was developed by Heros. Then came the far lateral. The name was coined by Spetzler. And then, which I like, you are Ernest Neme was talking about enough lateral approach, which is an excellent uh, name for the approach, which uh, actually covers all. Then there are all those extreme lateral, transcondylar, and whatever kingdom, far, far lateral. And uh, I do not think that there are many indications for this, and actually I never needed it. Always this enough lateral was enough. So this is the lateral approach. You see the hemangioblastoma in the upper cervical cord. It's on the right side, so it's lateral to the side. This is after. So this is what Heros has described. What are the steps of this enough lateral approach? We use straight or slightly curved incision. We move muscles more medially because the lateral slope of the muscles gives you the angle of approach. If you imagine it, you cannot go beyond the slope of the muscle. This is the limit of the approach, how much uh, you will see anterior to the brainstem. And it also gives you the necessary drilling. You don't need to drill much more 
because if you drill more, you anyway won't use this space. So how much medial we need, that's our extent of drilling, and that's how we need to uh, retract the muscles. Condyle resection to read the vertical line with hypoglossal canal, so that you see it directly. You do not need to go uh, too much beyond that, and you hardly need to go as deep as the hypoglossal canal, which is the limit of the condyle drilling. What's important in majority of regions, it's posterior uh, fossa based drilling. It should be flush with the skull base, as much lateral as needed, and then upwards along the um, sigmoid sinus. That's probably the most important feature of the approach, not the condyle itself. To transpose the vertebral artery, it's very rarely needed, and usually the vertebral artery entry into the dura is the limit of drilling. And even this is not always necessary. Because the work, what you need to do there, can be done above and below the condyle. You do not need to drill the condyle to have everything on the felt side. You can wear above the condyle and then go below the condyle. It's the case of uh, meningiomas, as we shall see later. This is the position which we are using. Very simple, very easy, very, very comfortable. And these are the sketches from the literature. This is too much, but what we do, what you need is this region of the condyle of the vertebral artery, and that's it. And you see almost everything from the first cervical nerves up to the seventh, eighth. That's the region which you approach with this inaflatter approach. And this is from a BNI publication. And you see that uh, the space is not really that big, but there's everything. This is the vertebral artery entry into the dura, and this is the seventh, eighth. And that's all you need for this far lateral approach. And you get almost everywhere for all the lesions in this region you need to resect. What lesions are there? It's going from CC junction down to C1 and lateral posterior fossa up to the meatus. That's exactly what's on this image. That's what, what you do. And there are extra axial lesions. First, without nervous system displacement, those are usually aneurysms. With nervous system displacement, usually meningiomas. And then there are intra axial lesions, and those are cavernomas and tumors. And now we shall go from one to the other. And usually, or per se, always, it's combined with telover. You need to move the tonsil, you need to create the space for yourself to see the brainstem, to get in front of the brainstem, usually. So this is the aneurysm at the junction of the vertebral arteries, forming basilar. I do not think that I would ever go again for this surgically, because there are endovascular means. But you see that surgically, this can be done. But those lesions which are without the nervous system displacement, and which are in the midline, are usually difficult to reach. They are far away, they are hidden by all the nerves and all the structures, so this is not that, is, uh, that easy. Another aneurysm, when we started with um, endovascular in 2000, that was the ruptured part of the aneurysm, which was coiled, and we never were able to coil this aneurysm, so this one was treated surgically with the use of endoscope, and this was in 2000, you see the date here, then the lady came back a year ago with a relapsed aneurysm. You may imagine that there were lots of dis discussion which aneurysm relapsed, whether it was the cold one or the surgically treated. It's obvious from this image that there was that endovascularly treated, which uh, recurred, which uh, regrew. And this is the final image. And this was obviously done by uh, endovascular techniques. So this is pretty difficult to go to the midline when the nervous system is not displaced. These are the pica aneurysms, which I like to operate when they are in the bad condition. This is a female, which is 32 years old. She came in with Glasgow coma five. And you see the amount of blood which is in front of the brainstem. And it, it really makes a compression. So if you clip the aneurysm, which is over here, and you clear some of the blood from the CC junction, from the fourth ventricle, the patient may and would improve because the decompression of the posterior fossa 
is paramount and because the supradentorial part of the brain is endemic. So even the patients in a bad condition uh, may improve. So in pica aneurysms, we go just against our normal aneurysm policy. The more suffering the blood, the more we go for surgery. The worse the condition, again, the more we go for surgery. And the, of course, the more lateral aneurysm, then we go for surgery. Those midline pica aneurysms are difficult. Then for meningiomas, from for extra axial lesions, I'm not good at drawing, but I believe that this will be uh, clear enough. I never ever have seen a tumor in front of the brain stem or cervical, upper cervical cord, which would be directly midline and which would form the brain stem like the U. Never saw it. If I if someone will tell me that he saw it, I would like to see the case. Always there is some even slight side preponderance, and that is exactly our approach for this inaflateral uh, approach because the tumor itself provides you the space which you need to resect it. This is a small one in the CC junction. It's exactly the area which you have seen on the image. And what you need to control is the 12th nerve, which is inferior to the tumor and superior to the tumor. There is 9th and 11th, which is running all along the tumor on its dorsal side. Nothing really that special, that difficult. And you see that the condyle in this case is not really that much drilled, only slightly because all you can then be working above the condyle and then you can be working below the condyle. So this is uh, really uh, the probably the most important uh, message of my lecture that work can be done below and above and you do not need that much of a drilling. You see that the bone drilling in this case was not really that extensive. These dura tackling suture outside the wound they enhance the width of the approach and it's much better than to take it out of the wound. If you suture it to the muscles over here, then you get a little more space. And again, you see that the condyle is not really that much drilled, only the surface. And you are resecting the tumor above and below the uh, approach. Here is the 11th, which runs along the tumor and you have enough space both above and below, and you can resect it very safely, even with, uh, let's say, uh, minimal bone drilling. Without nervous uh, system displacement, the cavernomas, like this one, what you need to get to is exactly this point, where the cavernoma is nearly on the surface, and it looks like that. You see the drilling, this is the drilling of the uh, uh, condyle, which is not that extensive, but here you need to drill quite more extensively. You usually stop when you hit the emissary vein, which is directly in the middle. And here you see that then you dissect the arachnoid along the tonsil. You move the tonsil upwards and you easily get to the cavernoma, which is over here, and you have enough space to treat it. I'm going to show you a, another case. This is after. You see this case of this cavernoma, which is directly in the same spot. You see how the pons is dilated and moved. And if you get here below the 9th and 11th, I, hello, good to see you. You are directly on the spot you need, and you need this, this enough lateral approach. Again, the same drilling. And the drilling is more extensive over here than on the condyle. You do not need to drill the condyle too much because you are going to move the tonsil and you are going to be lateral of the condyle. So it's not really necessary to drill, drill the condyle that much. Here is 9th and 11th. Here you easily get up to the 7th, 8th. And in between them is pica, obviously. Now you will see how the cavernoma is coming to the surface. Here is the seventh and eighth and the meatus. And with minimal movement of the tonsil, you get there and you are able to resect the cavernoma from below the ninth and eleventh. And it's uh, actually the same work as everywhere with cavernoma that 
you just need to inspect the cavity after the resection not to overlook some of the nodules of the cavernoma. You see that now we are visit inside the brain stem. This is the bleeding along with the cavernoma. And it's being resected. And what we always do that uh, we then insert the endoscope just to uh, inspect the cavity. And you see that condyle doesn't hinder your approach at all. You, you have enough space even without any big, big drilling of the condyle. Let's go further. This is after. Even this, you need again to get to the spot over here. I, I hate going for cavernoma through the floor of the fourth ventricle. So it will be again the same approach, the drilling and the drilling on the base of the posterior fossa and only, let's say, reasonable drilling of the condyle. We never ever needed to stabilize the spine after any condyle drilling. It's always uh, sufficient for stabilization. And now what you need to do is really to free the uh, tonsil to get to the lateral side of the brain stem. And then with the help of uh, uh, electrophysiology, you will find the exact spot where to enter the brain stem and where to, how to resect the cavernoma, which is uh, directly in your site. You will see soon how we move it. You dissect the arachnoid. And this is the lateral portion of the brainstem when the tonsil is moved and now with the probe this is the floor of the fourth ventricle and now with the probe we look for the cavernoma and now we are from the lateral side in the cerebral peduncle resecting the cavernoma and again this is the enough lateral or lateral approach this is the patient after and you see the extent of the bone drilling this is the craniotomy on 3d uh, again, this is a combination of uh, enough lateral approach where you need to enter the fourth ventricle for the discovery papilloma, which is within the fourth ventricle, going through the foramen into the CP angle and going down to CC junction. And all this can be done with this enough lateral approach. These are the images after. It takes quite a lot, a lot of time because you are actually in three spaces. You are in the fourth ventricle, you are in the CP angle, and you are in the CC junction in the uh, Sistema Magna uh, region. So approach always is uh, tailored to the lesion. It's uh, nothing that the approach is uh, routine. Each approach is unique, and each approach is really tailored to the lesion. What you need to do according to that you perform the uh, approach, not vice versa. It's not the approach, it's really the leading element. The leading element is the condyle drilling and skull base and stipa. in regulation The more needle the go, the more material the range that you need to get. So the more you need to drill, not only the condyle, but especially the skull base or the lateral part of the and how much lateral base you need to expose? Again, this individual and it depends on the, on the vision itself. And what I have said and what I believe is the most important part is that it can be done above and below the contact and you can repair the contact and you can save yourself lots of drilling and uh, all those in between us. Uh, most recently, the occipital bone drilling is crucial. That's more important than the condyle. The same animals, this is the dog, the manager in the same region. And again, another one with the, this is the tribal tumor, but again, it will be the same drilling, the same in a other approach. And this is the patient after the surgery. All right, thank you. That's it for today. Yeah, sorry that Brad, we had some technical difficulties. Uh, Brad, yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. I want you to take over. Excellent. Excellent. As usual, enough flat. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I am going to do a very short presentation. I mean, we've been really, really going crazy over 
this uh, past few days and yesterday was uh, you know the the final cherry on everything so the 36 year old guy came and uh, you know he was heavily lifted from some some place and then i saw this huge hematoma and i thought it's okay i would rather go for a evacuation of the hematoma but when i saw the hematoma on the scan i thought maybe it's a bit odd and plus he was only 36 years old so i didn't actually plan for a cystinostomy uh, but i made a large flap i went in took out the hematoma and all hell broke loose you know i took out the hematoma and then the brain started swelling and it was terrible bleeding so uh, we I went in, literally, I went into the AVM. You won't believe it. Two bipolars went into the AVM. Uh, literally had to go circumferentially while all that bleeding was going on. And then took out the AVM. The brain was still swelling. So went ahead, did the cystinostomy, got the brain lax, came back, took some other part of the AVM. Finally finished excising the AVM. By finished by 9.30 at night couldn't even stand up. So, I mean, was praying, we couldn't sleep the whole night because I thought this guy is not going to make it well. When he made it to the ER, he was like only M3. So, but today he's good M5. He's, uh, the scan is looking very good. So sometimes luck plays a role too. And sometimes, you know, I probably, I mean, I, it was my second case yesterday. So I, I just wanted to get out of the evac and get out. But, you know, Sometimes these cases, they, they give you all these lessons. Uh, but at the end, everything that ends well, you know, is okay. So that's what I think. Now, I'd start sharing my screen. This is a uh, aneurysm that we did day before yesterday. And uh, the patient is safely back in the ward. So I'd like to show you. I mean, I'd like to get all the boys to see this and then we'll go through the steps. I'm sharing my screen. Vlad, are you here? I hear you. Okay. You do AVMs without the NGO? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I, That's just, right. I just put in the NGO today. <laughs> you know me, so. <laughs> right, so. Yeah, okay. Let's start this one. So this was a superiorly pointing aneurysm, nothing great, but just wanted to show you how things went. Yeah, so, um, I mean, we did a very small craniotomy, not this one, this is uh, what I did on the scan, but you could see that that is the IC, that is the anterior cerebral, that is one A2, and that's the other A2. So these A2s are literally, uh, you know, it's completely different from the standard definition of A2s. I mean, what you see in the textbooks, so you can see one A2 is anterior, the other A2 is posterior. So, and then you have a white neck, rather white neck aneurysm. And you can see the A1 is literally looping forward uh, from, the, from the IC. So, this is the picture, nothing spectacular. Um, so we went ahead and uh, we, the, so our aim was to obviously, you don't have to, you don't need a, a, a fancy craniotomy or anything. We did a very small craniotomy. You can see the size of this craniotomy and you can see how small is this dural opening, maybe about four centimeter, four and a half centimeter. The brain was a bit angry, but after the cisterns were open, the brain was quite lax. So that is the optic now. And the first thing that I open is this arachnoid, and then I go into this arachnoid. Here, this arachnoid is already open. So and I'm going forward with uh, the section of uh, the arachnoid above the carotid now. So that is a clinoid process, and that's a proximal sylvian. So we take off all these strands of arachnoid from over the carotid. I use a scissor for this. And then I go lateral to the carotid. You can see that is a 
that is the anterior choroidal vessel which is going backwards here in this region you will find the pecom so i'm cutting all the lateral carotid lateral arachnoid um, to the towards the third nerve i like to do this in every aneurysms so that i can free as much space before i start focusing on my aneurysm once i start focusing on the aneurysm then i will not open things i'm afraid so i i, I keep uh, opening all the spaces very well and you can see there's a lot of blood there trying after that arachnoid is open i'm trying to see distally taking off the blood clots and then that's a optical carotid window so here i can see a small vessel that's not the a1 the a1 we know it's a huge vessel so i'm taking off the arachnoid from there between that vessel and and the optic nerve lateral to the carotid i've already dissected so you can see this is the area of the pecom that's the area of the anterior choroidal there's a lot of blood there and that you can see the a1 there you start seeing the a1 there so i am dissecting the a1 you know that the a1 is looping back so you're going this is superiorly pointing aneurysm so the interoptic space is okay for me to dissect so and obviously you have to take a little bit of gyrus rectus uh, in superiorly pointing aneurysms you it is always better to take a bit of a gyrus rectus a few millimeters of the gyrus rectus so you keep clearing all this blood and then you keep you go into the interoptic space a lot of blood there so keep on opening all the arachnoid there and wash out all the blood there not focusing on the aneurysm at all i use sharp dissection most of the time so now you can see the other opposite a1 so once you open up the interoptic uh, space you can most often see the opposite a1 you know the, the good thing about these aneurysms are that the moment you start opening up this arachnoid even though you don't want things to be seen things will be seen that's a beauty of it you know you just keep on opening arachnoid and slowly things will come into view i mean you should know where to open that's another thing i mean if you keep on opening it the wrong spaces maybe and now you can already see the aneurysm you can see the aneurysm directed superiorly you can see the a1 there opposite a1 ipsilateral a1 contralateral a2 and ipsilateral a2 will be here you can see the ipsilateral a2 already contralateral a2 is going there so i am dissecting this is always something that is found over the ruptured aneurysm so you can dissect this piece of clot away from the base never dissect it away from the dome this is very safe dissection at this point so you dissect this clot i mean you it's like disrobing that aneurysm gently you know pulling that thing up so you put a you know i i generally don't put a temporary clip but in this case i know uh, i'm not seeing this part i have inspected from here this it's not a complex aneurysm i can get away with a clip so i'm going with a clip but i'm putting in a temporary clip so it proved to be a blessing because you see what happened now as i was as i released the clip that's what happened <laughs> so i was like what the hell and then the aneurysm ruptured okay so i'm trying to open this and i realize that i cannot open this because and if i pull i know that the aneurysm is so the clip is stuck to the aneurysm and i can't pull it if i pull it that aneurysm will tear so i 
go for a, another application and design your resume options. Okay. So I am slowly trying to position my clip. I have the I know I have the temporary clip on the ipsilateral A1, but the contralateral A1 is bleeding. And you see now what happens? The the contra ipsilateral A2 gets into my clip. I just I just reposition it back immediately. And then I clip this animals. That's all. And that, that's a ipsilateral A1. That's a contralateral A1. And it's done. So uh, we take off the, uh, the temporary clip. All the vessels are clearly seen the Huebner's, the contralateral A1, the ipsilateral A1, both A2s. And we've taken only this much amount of uh, a few millimeters of the gyrus rectus and this aneurysm is done. So that's about it. Uh, any questions or anything or anything, any step that you want me to review through? I'm game. So. Can I have a remark? I... Go ahead, Vlad. Yeah. Was I, uh, you, you were opening the interim spheric fissure first. No, 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 no. I was not opening. I did not go from the interhemispheric. You did? What was that at the beginning? You had your A1 on your ipsilateral side, and then yes. you were opening the, uh, the interhemispheric, just a bit. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. What this I always do that I undergo the whole complex uh, of a com. Yeah. yeah. Uh, to see the A1 on my side, to be able uh -huh. to put the temporary clip. Then I undergo the complex and dissect the contralateral A1 so that I have both these secure. And yeah. only after that, I go for the interim hemispheric fissure and for the aneurysm. So yeah, that yeah. I see both A1s I, and I can put the temporary clips anytime. So the both, not only one. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're, you're right. right. But, but um, um, what I, I mean, I saw the... Before I put the temporary clip, I, I dissected the in the I mean I dissected the optic interoptic system and I, I can show you the contralateral A1. Yeah. Okay. And then tell me, uh, you do not do the ventriculostomy terminal ventricle cell uh, ventricle. Ah uh, no. no, I no. there is no intraventricular blood. I generally earlier I used to Juha religiously performs that. But uh, I do it only when there is uh, intraventricular blood. If there's okay. no intraventricular blood, I don't want to introduce intraventricular blood by opening the. In your case, this is not the part of cisternostomy. Am I right? Yes, yes, it's not. Yeah. Again, because there are people who are opening the lamina terminalis in each aneurysm, which I, I don't think is too smart, but uh, they, they take it as a routine approach to open the lamina. You do Juha, not do it. Yuha does that, but yeah. I don't do it. Uh, I think it's introducing blood into a virgin ventricle. There's no need for that. Exactly, exactly. That's my concern also. That uh, you have a clean ventricle, you open the lamina, and then you have the blood in the cell ventricle. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so that's it. Only the if blood, there is blood, then I open. If there is blood, there's a lot of blood in the ventricle, then I open. And I sure, open and sure, wash. Sure. Now tell me, you really are that brave that you are operating on AVMs without angiography? Yes, I mean yesterday, I I had no angio, nothing. Only a, a large a CT showing a huge temporoparietal hematoma in a 36 year old guy. One people dilated M3, and you know, I. I don't know. I, I didn't think about. I didn't really consider AVM as a serious diagnosis because. Oh, you were going for hematoma only. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Yeah, it was. Nice surprise, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. And uh, when I realized that Salona was with me, and when I realized it, it was uh, when I took out the hematoma. In, immediately, I realized that this is an AVM because I saw at the op moment I opened the dura. There were so many vessels, huge uh, vessels on the surface, and I realized it's an AVM. And I told him, would run away. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and the brain was swelling, and the brain was really swelling, and it was yeah. tremendous bleeding. You know? How is the patient doing now? The patient is doing fine. The patient is doing absolutely fine. Yeah. So Lucky he, you. 
his people has come back. He's uh, he's M5 now. Uh -huh. So good. Um, yeah. So everything is everything is very good. Right. <laughs> Yeah, so, but I'm, I'm so tired and sick and, you know, all the time you go to these AVMs with uh, plans and, you know, you, you plan for a day or two and, you know, you, you go circumferential. I generally, when I take my AVMs, uh, Vlad, I don't get into the nidus at all. I stay at least a millimeter or two millimeter away from the nidus. So that's my, uh, I mean, I don't know how people consider it, but I consider it very safe. In this case, I don't have any NPPB bleeding <laughs> So I stay one millimeter. So I am in the brain parenchyma all the time. Okay. So this makes it very, very avascular. And you know, you have, you know, the AVM is there and you can manipulate the AVM, you go all around. So that parenchyma, that glyotic parenchyma, I keep it. I never go into the nidus. I never, you know, I never touch the nidus. Sure. So is, is the AVM ruptured and you are going on uh, emergency or uh, urgent? Then you cannot distend the vessel. Then the resection is somewhere behind always. Yeah, yeah true. It must stay in the, the in the brain, not in the by the nidus. That's yeah, true. Yeah. So I see a lot of guys uh, taking a lot of time dissecting the nidus out. So I always uh, I always stay one millimeter away. I mean, I would see the AVM through the brain. It will be that thin. But I always in this way, these vessels when you bipolar them, they are well formed vessels. And, you know, the, as you said, the intransit vessels are the ones I look out for. Otherwise, you know, that's how I usually take my AVMs. I, usually, I never need, uh, I mean, blood transmission for my AVMs. At okay. least for the last four or five years. But yesterday was crazy. Yesterday was like, you know, I, I told all the expertise that I know. Everybody was, you know, but, you know, by the, to, towards the end, after I put the microscope, things calmed down. So then I could take vessel by vessel, but the first one hour was completely, completely crazy. I'm sure you've seen a lot of them. I can imagine. <laughs> I can imagine that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, yeah. I have a question. Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead, Manuel. Please. Hello, Professor. How are you? Hey, Manuel. Tell me, when you were talking about talking to me yesterday, I had just <laughs> finished the day with and come back. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I see you're, you're very, very, very tired. Professor, w w because um, something I was reading and you have the experience, uh, uh, maybe you can, you can share uh, uh, with us. It's about yeah. in, in your experience, which, yeah. one is the, which one is the best, uh, or the, the best way to, uh, to make surgeries in some different um, variation of the aneurysma? of the projection, the projection of the aneurysma uh, of the anterior communicant artery. Because, for example, for, uh, I, I was reading about uh, some projection, but for us, it's, 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 it's hard because we don't have the experience. And okay. we, we read in the book, but in surgeries, sometimes we don't know, we don't know like which one is the projection and what you're gonna do in different projection. I, I don't know if you understand, I, I explain yeah. right? We wrote a chapter on this with uh, Professor Carter, so I can, I understand you. I, and this is very important too. So um, I'll tell you, it's very easy. You need to look at the dominant day one way. The aneurysm is always going to be projecting in the parallel way, okay? If the dominant day one, you need to, I mean, and don't be fooled by, the dominant day one's proximal part. The dominant day one may take a turn, okay? And the aneurysm will be projecting in that direction. So it is uh, most often, I mean, I'm not telling this is, the, this is true in all cases, in complex aneurysms or fusiform aneurysms, this is completely different. But most simple aneurysms are going to be projecting in the direction of the proximal A1, I mean the dominant A1, okay? Now, now let's come back to how you manage cases when there is different projections. Uh, we will not look at so many projections. We look at the most common projections. One is the inferior projection. That is usually sometimes, uh, usually between the two optic nerves. This is the most easiest actually. And it's treacherous because as Vlad said, when you go across 
When you have to go across to get the other A1, I mean, you are going past the aneurysm. So this is going to be a bit difficult, okay? You have to go past the dome of the aneurysm to get the opposite A1. So as Vlad said, I also, if I always pray that if it's an inferior pointing aneurysm, it's a dominant, really dominant A1 with a very, very small A1 on the other side because you have to dissect past this aneurysm to get to the opposite A1. Can be done, but not very pleasant, okay? Now, Vlad, you're muted. You're muted. Vlad, you're muted. Vlad, you're muted. You're muted. Let me try to mute him. Uh, I... Most important part in any aneurysm surgery is to secure the feeding vessels. Once you have them, the aneurysm may rupture. It doesn't matter at all. And uh, once you do this, and in ACOM, you can do that only by securing both A1. And if you dissect the arachnoid along the one optic nerve, you just go across the interoptic space to the other optic, and thus you get the opposite side A1. It's uh, not, not that difficult. And you do not harm the aneurysm at all. You just move it a bit, but it's still hidden by the brain. The ACOM aneurysms are difficult in a way that you come obliquely. To all the other aneurysms, you go, you go directly, you know, like ophthalmic or uh, PCOM or whatever. But to ACOM, you come obliquely and it's still hidden be behind the uh, ipsilateral uh, rectus gyrus. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yes. I, I guess they are the, one of the most difficult ones. E even the basilar tip is not that difficult because basilar tip is in the interpeduncular system. There's quite a lot of space once you get there. But not the ACOM. ACOM is squeezed between the two frontal lobes. You need much more dissection than in basilar tape aneurysm. Yeah, I would uh, want to show two minutes of one of uh, the most crazy aneurysms that we've had in recent times. I mean, uh, let me share this. Uh, I think it's gone from the desktop. I think it's gone from the desktop. This one, John knows about it. You remember, John, the, the aneurysm which gave you the heart attack? Oh, yeah. I still yeah. have a little chest pain from that. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, I mean, uh, that, is, that is one. I was looking for that aneurysm. No, I can't find it. Okay. Yeah, so what we had is sometimes the main, the main problem that we face with these aneurysms are when even after the ventriculostomy, the brain is stony tight. The patient's disease is only M3 or uh, M2 and the relatives want surgery. And uh, MCAs you can easily manage. You really don't need to open the sylvian fissure. You need to just get into the blood and suck the blood out, you can get the proximal MCA, that's very easy. But ACOMs, believe me, I mean, this is going to be, as Vlad said, this is going to be really tough. I've tried cystinostomy and then, you know, the brain is, you know, you, the brain is really on your face and you don't have to get to the proximal A1, to get to the aneurysm, it's a real tough struggle. So, um, ah, I have it. Do you use lumbar drain? Yes, yes, we use lumbar drain. Uh, but sometimes these ones, um, I mean, some, some, ones are, some, some of these ones are crazy. I mean, let me just show you this one. Ah, are you seeing this? So this is a case where the patient was very, very low score and uh, uh, we did a ventricular puncture and after draining almost 30 ml of ventricular puncture, the dura was stony hard. So we know what to, we know what we were expecting and we know we opened and we went 
So this is an aneurysm where you can see the angiogram as Vlad always tells me, I go ahead and don't present the angiogram. So it's a ACOM Fisher 4, WFNS 4, stony hard even after the EVD drainage, severe swelling and bleeding. So you can see that's an aneurysm. That's an aneurysm there. So you see the temporal lobe coming out and I'm trying, what I'm trying to get is, I've got this, op this optic nerve, I have to get the other optic now and I know the aneurysm sac is below. So it's so tense that I'm, I'm trying to get the other optic nerve there. You can see the aneurysm sac there. That you can see the other optic nerve there. And you know you have to put a clip across like that. That's, that's what you need to do. And here, there is no time for detailed dissection and stuff. So I'm going to put a clip here. Here, the patient's BP is variable and anesthetist is telling me. So I just, this is my mistake to hurry, you know. So I would have, generally, I, I, I am the guy who spends a lot of time dissecting and, uh, you know, seeing everything. And so when you put the clip and this, what happened? Okay. <laughs> and you can imagine with a swollen brain, this thing happening. Okay. So we tried to take off that clip. There was not even space to take off that clip. You wouldn't imagine. So the brain was so tight that, I mean, I can't pull on anything because that aneurysm will tear. So I have to open that thing properly. And there was just no time. So there was no proximal control. There was nothing. So we, we realize that it's, it's getting really difficult. So you can see the rupture going on. So we're trying to get the proximal vessel, proximal A1 here. So trying to get some control. There's a lot of vessels there, it's bleeding like anything. So now I see the, some vessel, I mean, I don't know whether it's proximal A1, I see distal A1. So I see a vessel which is big and I put clip on it. This, is, this was my policy, okay? So, and I, and I see another vessel on the other side and I put my clip. I'm not rupturing anything, I'm not bipolaring it, okay? I don't want to bipolar. So it's going on and going on. And I'm trying to get some space lateral to the optic nerve so that I can see the A1. Again, putting some clip on the next vessel that I, next bit of vessel that I see. And you know, I'm not even seeing these vessels because I'm just using my memory. When I'm suctioning, I, I know that I saw a vessel somewhere and I'm using that memory to put a clip. You must understand that because I cannot put my suction and clip together. I have to first suction, then put the clip. So I'm asking my resident to give me some space on the temporal lobe. And some of these clips are just coming off. The bleeding is, you know, coming down after putting this many clips. So we realize that the bleeding is coming down. It's not as probably because, you know, after all that bleeding, the blood finished. So, but anyway, the patient was okay, stable by that time. So we, we saw what we thought was the ipsilateral A1. And then bleeding started a little bit more getting under control. And, you know, I put a few more clips there just to make sure. And then I saw the big vessel. Okay. And so we, we did that. So basically, there's a lot of clips on this. So now I put a clip here. <laughs> and I'm going to take off because now I put a lot of clips. Now I got to take it off. Take one by one. So I'm going to take off all those clips. The last <coughs> clip of the bleeding is my, my friend. Okay. All the other clips, I don't need them because they are already, there's no space for me. So I'm going to take it off one by one. And when I take off this,
clip, there's some bleeding, but I see there's a bleeding. Now I'm going to put a clip across there. And that clip did the job. See, the aneurysm sac is there. That's a rupture. You can see the rupture point. That's a rupture. Okay. But I have put a clip uh, compromising the A1, A2 junction there. So that's the A2. You can see the A2, ipsilateral A2 there. And that's a con ipsilateral A1. These are all the perforators behind. So I am taking off the clips from there. I put a clip, but that's really compromised the A1A2 junction. So I'm putting another clip trying to, you know, this clip is of no use to man or animal. I'm putting a clip inside the, inside that aneurysm. And I suddenly realize that it's of no use to anybody. So then I, I take it off and I see the aneurysm dome now. So I, I know clearly where the neck is now. Or at least I know clearly better than the first time that I put the clip on. So you can see the A1, that's the A2, and my my clip is uh, you know it's it's going across the A2 A1 junction and uh, it's obliterating the A2 off. So so after. A little bit of struggle we we put another clip and this bleeding completely stopped but then we did an ICG and we found out that there's no flow in the A2. So now the difficult decision of taking the clips off when you've got control and you know it's very tempting to just close and go and think that okay everything will be all right but I've done that a few times and I don't want to do it again because I'd like to you know stand and go the whole 12 rounds of the fight. So I don't want to throw the towel in and say, okay, this is what, this is what it is. I don't want to do that. Well, so I realized that I had to take the clips off and then I told my team, be ready for another catastrophe. And so we're ready, we're ready. And now we're going to take that clip off. We go ahead and take the clip off, praying that I'll get some time to clip that aneurysm. Because with that clip on, there's absolutely no space for me. And you can see the aneurysm filling up. Because we've clipped the rupture point, that aneurysm is filling up now. You can see. But somehow this clip moved and you know, I just moved this clip and that's it. So we had the rupture again, but this time I knew where the neck is. That's the difference. Earlier I was blind. This time I know where the A1 is. This time I know where the aneurysm is. So we put in two suctions and I go for the definitive clip. And I know I just turned the A A2 A1 junction with my suction. And that's a, that's a sack. So I put, I, I turned the A2A1 junction, that's an aneurysmal sack. And I see the neck there clearly. It's bleeding. And I go distal to where I've clipped the aneurysm uh, tear and then I put the clip on there. So that aneurysm is clipped. Uh, of course, the patient had a very, very stormy post-operative period and he is still around M5, so I wouldn't say it was a fantastic result, but these are things you got to be ready for in A1, I mean in ACOMS. So, uh, well, I mean, as Vlad said, I would consider Basilar to be less treacherous than some of the A1s, I mean ACOMS. Yeah. This was the worst time rupture before you had the vessels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And this is also a case for endovascular. We do uh, not see this uh, since we have the endovascular service. The, yeah. the, this would be definitely the aneurysm for endovascular. 
we, we, we don't have this service. I know, I know, I know, I know. I lived through these ruptures uh, in the past as well, you know, I hated it. <laughs> I just needed two nitro today, that's all. <laughs> uh, Sunil, any comments to Ipe or uh, Vlad, Sunil or, or uh, Rakesh? Hello guys, are you there? Rakesh, are you there? Oh, perhaps he stepped away. Okay, very good. Uh, thank you a lot. Thanks a lot, Vlad and uh, Ipe. Um, Prakash is my boy, the Prakash Kafle. I'm sorry? Well, the Prakash that you were talking is, uh, I think he's my consultant, Prakash Kafle. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. He around? I don't know. Let me go through the roll here. Okay, any comments or questions of Ipe or uh, Vlad from the panel? Anybody in the panel? Yes, yes. Go ahead, yes. go ahead. Uh, good. Hello, everyone. Hello. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, Saeed Eid Bin Ali from uh, Marrakesh, Morocco. Welcome. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Bennett, Professor uh, Benes, and Professor Sherian for these uh, excellent lectures. I, I had some uh, connections problem. Uh, my question for you, but is, uh, related to intraoperative rupture of antracranial aneurysm. Uh, did you have in your series some uh, intraoperative rupture before dura opening? And how did you manage this situation from the surgeon's side and from the anesthetist side? Thank you very much. I can tell you we have had two in a series of uh, 2000 aneurysms. And you see it that the dura suddenly becomes tense. In both cases, we just uh, quit the procedure. We didn't open the dura. We quit the procedure. One of the patients died. The other one uh, survived rather well. You know, two, two cases like that. And uh, I probably, should it happen again, I would uh, close the wound again. Yes. You yes. must consider that the uh, surgery itself, per Definition is another hit to already damaged brain by the subarachnoid bleeding. So if you can avoid it or postpone it to better time, it's always advisable. I, yes. What do you do when it ruptures before dura opening? Well, in my uh, about 600 aneurysms uh, over the last uh, 12 years, We've had five ruptures and I, rup I remember each one of them. So, uh, two were ACOMs and uh, this is not one of them. Two were ACOMs. We clipped them, both of them died. So, um, they didn't make it. One was an MCA. So, um, it ruptured when the pin was applied. <laughs> Because we knew when the pin, after the pin was applied, the patient was, uh, you know, it was a MCA and the patient was 15 by 15. The pins were applied, immediately the BP went up. And the BP went up and the BP was like 240 and all that. So we knew that the, 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 she had ruptured. So we went in as fast as possible. Uh, we didn't even have, even have to split the sylvian fissure because the dura opened, there was blood spurting out. I just had to dive into the blood and uh, get the proximal control and then clip the yeah. aneurysm. Yes, that, I, I, yes yeah. I, had, I had two cases in my university hospital center of Marrakesh and it was uh, catastrophic. Yeah, yeah. Very, yeah, very this, difficult. This patient, you must understand, this patient completely recovered and then she had a bone infection. They had, she had a bone infection which kept us on tenter hooks for a long time. So that was my third one. Another one was a, a, a basilar PCOM, so which ruptured. We went in, we didn't figure out which aneurysm had even ruptured. So we, we went under cardiac arrest uh, for over 30 seconds. We clipped the PCOM. Uh, I put a very, very long clip onto the basilar tip aneurysm, which I thought was the basilar tip aneurysm. I didn't even know what was going on because 
I couldn't even dissect that. I put a very, very long clip because no, absolutely no space to dissect. So I took the longest clip and I went through the optical carrier window, opened the clip and put it on. So that was a, that was a, a, a basilar. And uh, another one I think was an anterior choroidal, which again uh, ruptured very soon, just before opening the dura perhaps. Uh, and then that, that probably, I mean, I, I, I think the patient didn't do well as well. So I think, as Vlad said, surgery uh, would be, you know, surgery in these cases are near futile, but I still wouldn't, I still wouldn't leave it. I would go and open it and see what, what is it that I can do. So. Yes. And, yes. And, and this, this uh, role in this situation is very crucial also. I don't know, maybe as Vlad said, patient had already survived a subarachnoid hemorrhage, so he might survive another one, for all you know, but um, I don't know, I haven't thought it like, I haven't thought at it like that, because when the patient is on the table and the patient is ruptured, I would probably think that I would rather go ahead and see what I can do. I mean, my results have been pretty bad, probably one out of the five has survived without any problems. Uh, the rest of all of them, maybe three dead and one very, very bad GOS. Uh, that's all I can say. But now we have changed a lot of things. And that is uh, when you bring the patient to the ice uh, from the uh, theater, I mean, to the theater, we're going to give them uh, some the anesthetist is going to give them a cocktail to make, make sure that they are calm, their BP is not up. Earlier, we never used to care about, you know, putting pins now, but when you put pins, you have to go very high on the pain relief and then put local, make sure. So we, we do all that for aneurysms now. So probably in the last three, four years, maybe I haven't found anything rupturing way too before I, I operate. Uh, but uh, I really wouldn't want it. It's not a, it's not a pleasant scenario when you are in your office and those guys are doing craniotomy and they tell, looks like Daniel is some rubbish. <laughs> okay, thank you. I would want to hear that. Thank, thank you very much. I'm muted, John. Um... Yeah, any more comments, questions from the panelists? <clears throat> So Neil, you have anything to add? Perhaps not. Anyone else have anything to say? Well, we had a nice session with you, huh? I. Are you had? Yes, yeah, so he's going. He's going to do them uh, on Fridays. Okay, I yesterday for gym session. Jim and uh, me, we used to be teaching together, maybe eight years back in uh, Salim's place, long time back. But I wanted to say hello to Jim, but then I came and then that's when this AVM came in. So I had to go back. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, I think, he's, I think he's gonna do more. Yeah, but I, I'm, I'm a bit sick and tired of the webinars now. I mean, the moment I see Zoom now, it's kind of an allergic. Yeah, yeah. yeah. okay. Well, whatever you wanna do, like whatever, whatever. No, I, I would I would join the daily dosages every day, but okay. there is so many of these. Yeah, there there is a ton. There is a ton. So well, thank you guys for coming out, and we'll wrap it up. And tomorrow, what is it tomorrow? I do you know. Yeah, tomorrow I think Mustafa is uh, doing something. Oh, okay, yeah, great. I should moderate, John, but I don't remember who who are the lecturers. Mustafa is tomorrow, right? I, who? Mustafa. Mustafa from, from Wisconsin. Mustafa Baskaya. From Nursing from Wisconsin. Uh, um, good well, guy. Good guy. He does a good job. Very good job. Well, we'll see. Are you, uh, are you trying to take my job, Vlad? No, no, no. I will uh, keep it. Keep it. Keep <laughs> it. I, I don't <laughs> like unemployed people. No, that's okay. It'll just be temporary. Once the co co corona is over, you can go back. I shall let you do your job. Okay. 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 
Okay, everybody. Thank you very much. See you tomorrow. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. I, my, my best. Too.